Welcome back to Realism Overhaul. Today we are launching another Sparrow Mark 2.2 to kick off this episode. Last episode we watched six failures of this rocket and one success, and we're hoping for another success again. Uh, its mission today is to send a probe to impact the moon, just like last episode, because the contract to complete a lunar impact allows three completions of the contract, so we're just trying to get some, some nice money here. And also, we can get a little bit more science from low space above the moon for the small amount of time before impact, like a minute or so. These flights are proving to be monumental for our space program, both in funds and science. In a nominal launch up to this point of Sparrow 2.2, we ended up having an X405 failure. Luckily, the second X405 was able to kick in its gimbal and keep us straight, However, it also eventually failed as well. Luckily, we were still going fast enough and we didn't lose too much Delta V in order to complete uh, this mission because the next AJ-10 stage has enough fuel to compensate for such failures. up the final stage with RCS, we are letting go and putting ourselves on a translunar injection of sorts. Of course, because this is this has to be done 9 degrees off the lunar plane, it has to be done at an ascending or descending node, which means we are not the most efficient, at least time-wise, but this doesn't really hinder our mission at all. Again, all you have to do is cut the thrust close enough, use fore or aft RCS to bring us to an impact trajectory. Later on in 1961, we have another KX-5 Mach 2 holding pattern flights to get like 30,000 funds or so. And this is a new Kerbal, Flurby Kerman's first flight. He's getting his wings today. Now, as we all know, with these KX-5 flights, landing is the most deadliest part of the mission. And so far, Flurby's got it until the parachute deploys, putting us on a death wobble. And unfortunately, Flurby Kerman's first flight is also his last. I'm so sorry, weak chef from the Discord, for losing your Kerbal so soon. Uh, I did note they were they were very cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I feel so, so bad. Um, this actually led to us designing a retro rocket for landing these things if we ever decide to bring the KX-5 program back to life. Uh, as it stands right now, the funds aren't that great and we're losing Kerbals from it, so we may just bring an end to the KX-5 flights for those X-Plane supersonic contracts, at least for now. And then soon after, towards the end of 1961, we have a, another flight of the Sparrow 2.2, what is it, the ninth flight? And this one also is successfully going to impact the moon. So that brings our third and final contract completions of Lunar Impact to an end. And this leads us to a question of what to do next. So the way that uh, I saw it then, there was three different options. There was getting teched for interplanetary flybys, which I didn't quite have yet, so it'd have to be a little bit of a wait till I unlocked some nodes. It was exploring the moon again as our second option, because there were contracts to orbit the moon as well as land on the moon, but those also relied on the same tech for interplanetary, such as deep space probes. So what we ended up going with was our third and my personal favorite option of getting our crewed space program up and running. And this involved uh, buying some new engines that had absolutely terrible failure rates. So we built this rocket, which was intended to be a sounding rocket. It's got an LR-79, uh, or s I think it's an LR-79 and an RD0105. And these engines were going to be essential for what we built for a crewed space flight. So we needed to launch up a rocket in order to get some more data on the engines. And well, after I built a rocket in the editor, I realized it had enough Delta V to go orbital. 
So we accepted a contract to do uncrewed orbital return, which is what I decided to slap on the top of this test rocket um, as its payload. And surprisingly enough, it was it was very, very good at getting into orbit. There was no failures on this very first launch of the test vehicle. The payload involved was a, uh, a low space film. I, well, actually, I don't think it was called low space film. It may have just been called early film camera, as well as an advanced biological capsule. And the intent was to collect all of the science in um, a return capsule which was the thing shrouded in solar panels right now, and send it back to Earth, and hope that the parachute was strong enough to, well, keep it keep it from uh, hitting the ground too hard. Assuming it survives re-entry, that is. So its mission was to stay in orbit for about an entire day, roughly 24 hours, a little bit more, and then hope that we can find some place around Perigee where it faces uh, retrograde, since this is a completely uncontrolled probe now right here we're actually seeing i found a button in kerbalism well someone told me about it uh, that allows you to transfer science between a science experiment and a capsule while there's no kerbals on board because if you don't check that you have to have a kerbal on board to move science experiments from one experiment to an another place which is was kind of essential for gathering the science that we needed which would be around like 40 to 50 science, believe it or not. So staying in orbit for a little over a day, coming down and surviving re-entry, the parachute deploys. Um, and I had written a KOS script to jettison the heat shield, which never occurred. But regardless of that fact, the parachute was not strong enough to stop the probe from slamming down into the earth and losing everything. Immediately afterwards, in 1962, we redesigned the ITV um, with a different payload configuration with the now knowledge of being able to transfer science. We could hopefully simply bring back the tiny capsule with us. And also, I slapped a much larger parachute on top since the parachute that it came with was uneditable for some reason. So as long as that parachute survives re-entry, we should have absolutely no trouble here. And also we are launching on a different inclination. We are going for a polar orbit rather than straight east. And unfortunately, I did not account for the less delta V we would get from the Earth's rotation. And so this launch is sort of doomed not to reach orbit. We are not going to reach complete orbital velocity to orbit the Earth in this manner. However, the contract for returning from orbital velocity only requires a speed of 6,500 meters, which we actually meet. So what this means as long as this small probe here uh, re-enters and the parachute works fine, we're going to get paid. And although we don't get a lot of science, it is going to be a lot of money, which would be absolutely fantastic. Now starting to heat up here in re-entry, the wobble unfortunately did not stop and it put the parachute in, in the burn zone and well, we end up losing it here. And I only armed that one parachute and not the parachute that came with this probe, which in my defense through simulations was not strong enough to keep this thing from exploding on impact regardless. So we ended up losing yet another ITV, and this exact scenario happened a third time. This time I put the parachute inside of the small capsule and had the door open during re-entry, which also ended up burning up the parachute. So my next plan is to have the parachute inside that bay and have a KOS script open the door at like 20 kilometers. So our fourth flight of this next episode will hopefully be a success. And that brings us to our crewed flight to reach space. We had designed a brand new rocket in a brand new program called Icarus. And yes, you saw from the thumbnail earlier, this is in fact a space plane. It's been in development for quite a long time. And this vehicle here 
if everything goes nominally, is capable of reaching low Earth orbit, is capable of returning from low Earth orbit and surviving re-entry, and is aerodynamic enough to land at around 60 meters per second stall speed, 50 to 60 meters per second. So all in all, we are away. The ITVs earlier getting data on the engines. We are using the LR87s. Next stage would be X405s. And finally, the RD0105 on the space plane itself. Nominal launch so far. We are away. Approaching jettison of the first stage and hot stage of the second stage consisting of two X405s, we ended up lighting those two engines too soon, burning off the decoupler while the thrust of the first stage was still behind it, just launching the first stage into the second one, losing both second stage engines, and jamming part of the fairing into our left wing. Now luckily this craft has a board capability, even like this, and we are on a complete suborbital trajectory. Our apogee will reach 142 kilometers. Uh, what we need to do now is jettison our tanks, our external tanks, which are there for the final orbital insertion stage, and somehow try to get rid of this fairing. And it looks like time warp isn't really doing it for us. One of the more dangerous things with this vessel is, in fact, time warp. As you can see, the tail wing is a little disconnected until we jettison these tanks here. Uh, time warp ends up, like, really throwing the wings askew and just, like, they're off at odd angles and disconnected for each from each other. The Kraken really, really likes this spacecraft. So now we are coming back down into the atmosphere. We're dumping off all of our fuel to leave ourselves with this, um, much, as little, sorry, dry mass as possible to re-enter and hope that this survives. Luckily, we lose the fairing. However, what we don't lose is a really strange um, roll issue where we tend to roll, I think, to the right quite a lot. But we're starting our re-entry now. This spacecraft, technically the KX-6A, uh, has gone through a few different design changes. The first design wasn't capable of aborts like this because the cockpit was not covered by the space plane rated wings quite enough. And so it led us to this design with much larger wings to the front, which end up giving us a crap ton of lift in the front, which well, makes us face upwards here and put ourselves into a dive to, um, to correct that. <laughs> Otherwise, we might end up stalling up here. Uh, you'll notice also we have brakes on the tail wing. However, they weren't really responsible for all that much lift. That's pretty much left behind from a previous design, which did not have that much lift, and the tail uh, was necessary to keep our nose from diving down and blowing up the vehicle. So again, we are coming in for another landing here. This time it has to be in the water, but we get to know an example of why that nose lift, which can be a problem in re-entry, is so necessary for landing because it brings our stall speed so low that the landings are gonna be, well, not as dangerous anymore. So we deploy the brakes, parachute, and we are in the drink. That is a successful contract despite a complete rocket failure. We did not reach orbit, but we completed our contract of simply passing the Carmen line and got some crew report science as well. I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and peace out.